I guess that pours back into the music thing of like it being local. Mm. Like it's not necessarily Hawaiian. Yeah, yeah. We are of Hawaii, but it's the diaspora happened for so long now that it's local now. Right. Like it's not Hawaiian and Japanese and this and that. It's like the amalgamation of those things made its own thing. Right. I guess growing up in this house, that's kind of what happened. Well, today we're here with Nick Kurosawa. Thank you for having us in your super cozy home. You're welcome. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that sarcastically. <laughs> so Nick is a musician, mm -hmm. songwriter, artist. Mm -hmm. Can you start by describing like your style, your music style? The overarching element is just local Hawaii. I mean, if that can be equated to a music genre, but I like R&B, soul, funk, jazz, that kind of stuff, but with a lot of artistic things that are born here or of here, there's this certain tinge to it that I've been trying to track down to see what actually is. And what I've come up with so far that feels like a very DIY mentality. There's something about here that there's a lot of do-it-yourself flavor that goes on and the things that come out kind of end up being congruent with each other. And where did this whole journey with music start? I know you mentioned before your family's very like musical. My dad played in a funk band in the 70s called Natural High. So he played saxophone and he sang. And growing up in this house, every Sunday we'd clean the house and my mom would always be playing music and usually be a lot of R&B, soul. That's maybe why I do a lot of things by ear. Like I never, I don't know how to read music. I don't know much music theory. And I think that kind of training of just blasting music in your ears and singing at the top of your lungs, like I got more accustomed to the way that it felt coming out of me than the way it sounded. It was like an exploration for myself and then it became something of myself rather than somebody trying to instill knowledge through or onto me or through me. You know, often people will look at me and tell me, I never would have thought that would come out of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, that's what I think that is, you know. Right. I'm not actively trying to cultivate a sound, I'm just pushing as hard as I possibly can and then and it just comes, comes from out. doing it, yeah. yeah, like not like studying all these different things, but just exploring. Yeah, so I think less than being technically proficient, it's like people recognize that authenticity that yeah, comes out, yeah. you know. It doesn't feel forced, like yeah. you're not trying yeah. to create. You're not, you're not doing math, you're doing yeah, alchemy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, this song's called Woolsey. Um, it's about this house. Same old walls, but this house is being made of home. Same three floors, but the stories are being told. Mistakes are made like a bed from yesterday. This journey calls, but I haven't quite hung up yet. No, no. No, 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 no. No one in my family really knew that I like could sing, sing, mm -hmm. until I was a junior in high school. I had done a project for my English class. I made like a PowerPoint presentation of a bunch of images of slavery and I sang Redemption Song by Bob Marley. There was like a day where all those English students could perform that in the theater at school and like I invited my mom and dad and that was the first time I saw my dad cry. Mm -hmm. Because they had no idea, and with right, his, right. You know, like, why were you hiding this from yeah. me? Yeah, because I never really thought of my dad as a musician. You know, he settled down, started a family, he got his job, so he was always a handyman to me. Right. Like he would take me around, and I'd go work with him and do all kinds of stuff with him and learn stuff from him. And then it wasn't until that point in high school 
and then getting outside input from people telling me like, wow, you can actually do that thing. And then like, how do you balance being like a professional musician and having like handyman work, like you said, that's what you do too, right, mm -hmm. on your off time? I feel like sometimes when we push passion type of jobs onto people, they're like, oh, go all in and like, yeah. you know, push hard and, yeah. you know, forget your other job, just go yeah. all in and do it. But then you kind of have a different approach to it. I tried that for a while and the romanticization of that whole thing, it's great in a nutshell, but I think realistically it's like probably not a good idea to do it. Having played music full time and trying to do that whole thing, like to me I guess if I was traveling and like playing elsewhere and like seeing new things and maybe it might be a good thing for myself, but because I was just playing around town and doing it over and over and over again, it gets really taxing and I needed to make money. So mm -hmm. the correlation between making money while you're making art like really started to burn the candle at both ends for me. And I really enjoy working with my hands. That whole handyman thing was kind of a no-brainer for me because there's a point where the art starts to suffer because you need to make money yeah. doing it. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of people like that, even like graphic designers mm -hmm. or anything for video to mm -hmm. going too heavily on one thing mm -hmm. and then you start to lose that passion True. 100%. True. Like it just becomes work and... You need both. And yeah, maybe like you said earlier too, it kind of depends on where you are yeah. too. Like for, I think for me, when I went into video, I had like a restaurant job and I was like so over it. That's rough. I guess I had enough space to be able to like quit that and be like, okay, let's go into something else. Mm -hmm. And that was weddings. And then now I'm kind of at a point where weddings is mm -hmm. becoming that job. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, how do I find that balance mm -hmm. outside of weddings? Mm -hmm. And I think it's like, sometimes you go all in mm -hmm. and then maybe that's when you learn. Yeah. <laughs> like, You're not you really going to gonna know until you yeah. do it, right? <laughs> Can you share a little bit about your background, your parents, your ethnicity? So my dad's full Japanese. Then my mom's side is mostly Filipino, but I'm super mixed on that side. But in terms of like Japanese, local Japanese culture, I think it was more about like attitude or like emotion things rather than like physical cultural practices. Like, like it was values, more, core values or anything? Yeah, more just for lack of a better phrase, like being submissive and quiet and well behaved like it was a lot of that Humble. yeah very reserved like we have hardwood floors here and my parents used to their room used to be downstairs where I live now and we'd have to be like silent walking on the hardwood floors where my dad would just lose it <laughs> this is me it's the two Japanese kids that we had for like a week on playing baseball it's like an ex back, a Japanese exchange <laughs> that was my grandma's favorite beer. Like having gone to Japan, I guess I can see the correlations and like small things, like behavioral things. And I guess that pours back into the music thing of like it being local. Mm -hmm. Like it's not necessarily Hawaiian. Yeah, yeah. We are of Hawaii, but it's the diaspora happened for so long now that it's local now. Right. Like it's not Hawaiian and Japanese and this and that. It's like the amalgamation of those things made its own thing. Right. I guess growing up in this house, that's kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. Like my mom is heavily Filipino and my dad is heavily Japanese, but it's just a my family unit thing. It's not yeah, like, yeah. oh yeah, this is Filipino and this is Japanese. Right. Like, that's just my family. Going back to your music, I'm curious on how you are able to balance creating something that is truthful to you while also knowing that there's like an audience there for you and your mm. music because I feel like that's something you're able to do so well. Mm. With writing lyrics for me I notice that a lot of it's very veiled and I think that that allows me to be as truthful as I can without offending anybody or saying it in a wrong way that might not come across right. I, had, I played this gig in Waikiki once, and there was this really drunk guy at the bar, and he was the only one in the bar, and I was done. And I go and sit at the bar, have water, and just you know, kind of wind down from playing, and I'm talking to the bartender. And the guy turns to me, and he tells me, just point blank, like, man, that was really great, but I just hope you know that, that all of that is mine now. Wait, what? Yeah, that's verbatim, that's what he told me. 
and I, that I said the same thing. I was like, huh? What, what, do, you, what do you mean? mean? Yeah. What do you mean that's yours now? He's like, everything that you just did on stage, like, that's mine now. And I sat there kind of offended at first, like, you know, who the hell is this guy to tell me that? <laughs> And then I, I started talking to him a little bit more and then he divulged a little bit more of what he meant. And basically what he's saying is like, literally that. Right after it comes out of my mouth and off of my hands, like he can do with it, with it whatever he wants. I don't know, maybe before that it felt like I'm trying to harbor this as much as I possibly can and then let it go at like the latest possible moment. And then I had had control over it for enough time. But half, after talking to him, it really helped soften me up to that idea of just letting it go. Mm -hmm. After I let it go, it's like, right. that has nothing to do with me anymore. Yeah. Just like how people perceive your lyrics or whatever, yeah. it's up to each individual listener. Yeah. So if I leave that little bit of space for that interpretation for the person and believe in what this guy had told me, like, it's really simple. Why do you feel like you were um, so hesitant to not share your music, but to let that music go before? I still don't really know. Mm -hmm. I know it has something to do with cultural stuff, yeah, yeah. for sure, and being Japanese, and the not making noise, walking on the hardwood right, floor right, right. thing, probably. We're like feeling, what is that, like not worthy to share something. I yeah. think it's a very Japanese, I don't know if it's a Japanese thing, but I feel like yeah. it's a Japanese yeah. thing, feeling like you don't want to take up space. Yeah. You're small, right? Yeah. But I guess I've held on to that for so long because I I enjoy that. It keeps it keeps a straight line for me to to be that way. I don't know if it's like it allows me to feel okay releasing things and mm -hmm. like putting things out or what it is. But yeah, I don't like praise. It feels really awkward. I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. Because no matter what the response is, if it's a positive response to what their positive thing was to you, like it's gonna come off conceited. Right. It's so no opposite what. from like what we're taught to do in America yeah. is very like sell yourself yeah. and like why are you great? And I've never had like a real job interview mm -hmm. before. A lot of my jobs were through connections, mm -hmm. and I cannot imagine being like here are mm -hmm. here are reasons why you should hire me. Like it's so. <laughs> Against, and I feel like a big part of myself, like growing up in America or Hawaii in school, they really push that, you know, like mm -hmm. write your resume and like, mm -hmm. how do you do this? And I felt like, oh, like I, I suck at this. Dude, like, I, I don't know how, you should you know? see my resume, it's pitiful. Yeah, and then <laughs> even in film school, you got to pitch and like, you got to be good at selling, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then I, I felt like it, I just can't do it. Like, yeah. I feel like I still can't do it well. It um, definitely is a skill to have though, yeah. like you need it to survive. But, but also, yeah, are you losing that Japanese side yeah. by letting that go yeah. is what you're making me think about. Yeah. Like maybe it's okay to not be that way. It, it is to, up to a certain point and I've, I noticed that like because I'm not trying to market myself and push, 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 it just, again, like the lyrics, it allows space for people to try to find it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I thoroughly enjoy that and meeting those people or talking to those kinds of people, you know, they're, they're inquisitive for a real reason, for their own reason, not because they think that I expect them to do this and do that. It's like, you actually wanted to see what this was and you came and you found out. Mm -hmm. Like, that's beautiful. That's what I liked about Japan so much. Mm -hmm. You know, they're so invested in sonic art mm -hmm. that they want to know all the backstory, they want to know all these things because it furthers their understanding of what they're listening to and why that happened or why this is that way. And just being around people that love music that much, I'm like, <laughs> it's so backwards to hear. Music culture in general, I think, has taken a bit of a, a backseat to visual things, I guess. Or I make a lot of music and people are always asking me like, oh, when's the music video coming out? I'm like, dude, I have no idea. <laughs> are you making me a music video? <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. We can make a music video. <laughs> if you want, we can make one. It's like a lyrics video. <laughs> yeah, dude. What do you hope for, I guess, the future of this community, whatever this community means, means to you? Um, the music community here, the local community here. A dream I've always had was to have a concert in Diamond Head again. Oh. 
that's one of them. Where? Like they used to have concerts in the crater. But yeah, inf infrastructure, things like that, that'll help on the tail end of the music creation process. You know, there's a place, there's a platform to display it. There's right. a platform to... place for it to kind of live outside of just playing. Yeah, a CD that you get from somebody or like a download code, you know. Is there any questions you guys want to ask? Being the last yeah, episode. Like, <laughs> so I guess the question I would probably ask is like, what, why do you like cooking food at Oh yeah! <laughs> you guys got some wontons yet? Come eat some. Don't be shame, please. Kick it. If you guys want to get a record, let us know. We can sign it for you, whatever. There's yet, probably a plethora of reasons why. I guess the main one is I like feeding people. And it was all my mom was always that way. It was like all my friends would come over, would be skateboarding or whatever, and we'd come over, and she'd just make you food, you know, and that comfort thing just to get people feeling okay in the space, you know, that allows, for me anyway, when I experience something, if I feel okay and I feel at home in a space, I'm so much more open to ingesting what's yeah. going on. That's one reason. Two, I like cooking. <laughs> I've always liked the correlation between music and cooking. Mm -hmm. There's so much synonyms for me with the two things. I think that's why I really got into it. It's very much my style with making music as well. Like cooking, you can adjust as you go, with salt, whatever, seasonings. Baking is a little bit different. I it's tried a that. More technical. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was rough, man. <laughs> I had rubber bread for a while. Maybe those two things in, in conjunction with each other, you know, one for me, it's cross training for my music. And maybe if I see somebody enjoying my food, it kind of feels like they can enjoy my music too. Right. It's definitely like a nice experience as an audience member because I feel like sometimes when someone's performing it's like you're put on a pedestal yeah, right deified. but like we have this food that you made for everyone yeah. and like you eat it and it feels like we're suddenly yeah. just like friends sitting yeah. in a living room yeah, you know definitely. like that's definitely how I want people to feel when they're around me you know regardless I that might go back to the whole like feeling ashamed about the success of the thing yeah, you know like yeah. I don't want to put anybody on like I am trying to be as normal as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe a little way that I can show that, you know, like, just eat, like, it's fine. <laughs> just, just relax. Yeah, <laughs> fart if you have to, like, I could care less, you know, like, that makes us so much closer. I, that's been my thing. I just want to stay as normal as possible. I think that's, that's it. Do you guys want to be in a video? Final episode, say hi to the camera. <laughs> come, come sit here. <laughs>